and welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime and today I'm really looking forward to talking to you about Gambino boss Frank Scalise. Scalise was one of those mafia bigwigs who did most of his work from behind the scenes, but he did occasionally come into the front and make the headlines. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please head on over to that Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss, so let's get right to it. Francesco Scalisi was born on September 23rd, 1893 in Palermo, Sicily, to parents Vincenzo Scalisi and Emanuela Privatera. He had five brothers, Thomas, Philip, Jack, Joseph, and Giovanni. Scalisi spent his young life in Palermo, the first 20 years or so, and was no doubt, in my opinion, involved in the Sicilian Mafia. Although we don't have documents showing that from Palermo, when Scalisi came to the U.S., he was almost immediately given a high rank in the Mafia. Either that, or he was just that good of a mobster. Scalisi and his brothers immigrated to the U.S. in the early 1910s, around the same time that Salvatore Diacola was becoming the boss of his own family, and subsequently, the boss of bosses, following former boss Giuseppe Morello's sentencing to time behind bars for counterfeiting. Diacola broke off and started his own family around 1912. With this break from the Morello family, Diacola would also absorb what was left of the American Camorra gangsters in the Brooklyn area. His family would have territory in Brooklyn, Manhattan, specifically Little Italy, Harlem, and the Bronx, where Scalisi had most of his power. When Scalisi immigrated to the U.S., he settled in the Bronx and got started in his criminal career right away, quickly securing the position of capo in Diacola's new family, the predecessor of what is now the Gambino family and his name would be Americanized from Francesco Scalisi to Frank Scalise during this time. He would soon meet and marry his wife Joan, who already had a son. Once the two were wed, she would go on to have five daughters with him. He was also the cousin of Anthony Gaggi's father. Scalisi would be critical in the development of Gaggi's criminal career. Scalisi would be arrested for burglary in 1920, but was paroled. Despite how much we know about Scalise's criminal involvement, there's not as much on his record as you might think. Even at the point of his death, besides the burglary charge, all that could be found on his record was a vagrancy charge that was dismissed. That does not mean that the man was not involved in more serious crimes. Throughout his life, Scalise would be questioned about several murders, but, as one newspaper described him, he was a slippery man, and although law enforcement suspected him of several crimes, he was quite apt at getting away with them. In 1920, when Giuseppe Morello was released from prison, this created a direct threat to Diacola's power, so, within a year of Morello's release, Diacola placed orders to take him out. Morello would return to headship to find that Diacolo was very much his enemy. In 1922, Vincenzo Terranova, who had been in the leadership helm while Morello was away, and following the death of Nicholas Terranova, who had initially taken the job, would be shot dead in a drive-by shooting near his home by Diacolo killer Umberto Valenti. Valenti and Diacolo had previously had a falling out. Diacolo began to suspect that Valenti wanted to break off on his own and betray the family. So, to get back in Diacolo's good graces, Valenti had taken out Vincenzo Terranova and attempted to take out both Morello and his chief bodyguard and confidant, Joe Mazzaria. That plan backfired immediately. On the day that Valenti killed Vincenzo Terranova, he had intended to kill Mazzaria as well, but missed. Then he and another gunman, Silva Tagliagamba, tried to kill Mazzaria again, but Tagliagamba ended up getting shot and would later die from his injuries, while Valenti made it out alive. Valenti would attempt to kill Mazzaria a third time and again missed his target. At this point, he knew he was toast. Not only had he failed Diacola, but Miseria, no doubt, had a hit out on him. Valenti tried to arrange a peace negotiation with Miseria, but when he was the only one to show up for the meeting, he became suspicious and tried to leave. Before he could escape, however, he was gunned down by Miseria gunman Lucky Luciano and another shooter on August 11, 1922. It was at this point that Morello stepped down from leadership into the position of consigliere and passed the torch to Joe Miseria. This marked a major power drain in the Diacola family, and what it meant for Scalise is that he needed to be flexible as the rug was ripped out from under him. By October 10, 1928, Diacola himself would be gunned down. Alfred Manfredi, aka Alfred Mineo, who had been operating under Diacola, likely helped to orchestrate his boss's murder, as he would be aligned with Miseria at the point of his Mafia coronation. For Scalise, this did mean more power and control within the Mafia family. Miseria had powerful allies in Lucky Luciano, Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese, Frank Costello, Joe Adonis, Willie Moretti, Alfred Mineo, and Frank Scalise. All huge names on their own within Mafia history. This powerful alliance was very short-lived, however, as the castello Marese War would break out in 1930. Don Vito Ferro, all the way back in Sicily, wanted to seize control of the U.S. Mafia for himself and backed his man Salvatore Maranzano to get the job done. Maranzano's initial allies were fewer than Miseria's, 
He had Stefano Magadino, Joe Profaci, and Joe Aiello. Soon, however, he would have many more. When Alfred Mineo was murdered on November 5th, 1930, Scalise took his opportunity. Only nominally on the side of Miseria, Scalise had betrayed Miseria's faction, as did many others, including Lucky Luciano, in favor of Maranzano. It was the right move. It is believed that in August of 1930, Scalise and Anastasia had murdered Morello on Luciano orders. Maranzano took control after Miseria was killed on April 15th, 1931. Frank Scalise took control of his family after Mineo was killed on November 5th of that same year. Frank Scalise was known as Don Cheech, and although he did not maintain his position as boss, his nickname stayed with him. By September 10th of 1931, Luciano double-crossed Maranzano and killed him. This would lead to Luciano taking control of the criminal organization and restructuring it to match his vision. Luciano's vision did not include Scalise as boss of what is now the Gambino family. Scalise was forced to step down to make way for Vincent Mangano. At this point, Scalise's history goes pretty dark, but let me share with you what I've been able to pick up through context about what Scalise was doing during this quiet decade of his life. I have no doubt in my mind that Scalise was cooperative with Luciano, and that the two men had worked out some kind of deal. Scalise relinquished his power too easily and would go on to be far too involved with Cosa Nostra and friendly with Luciano for this to have been hostile. This must have been part of a working plan, as Luciano and Scalise were very close as far as mobsters are concerned. Not only did they frequently exchange letters with one another, but Scalise would actually visit Luciano in Italy. Additionally, we know that Scalise was aligned with Albert Anastasia. The two men worked very closely. Finally, by the end of Scalise's life, he was making a fortune with front businesses and rackets that I believe were started during this time. So throughout Mangano's reign, we see Scalise working on other projects. We find Scalise again in 1945, working with Bugsy Siegel to help him open the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas. The attempt of Siegel to trailblaze Las Vegas is a legendary endeavor, and Scalise must have seen this as a worthwhile investment, as did many other mobsters. However, although this project was a shoe-in for mob investors, the man at the helm was a disaster. Bugsy Siegel went down in infamy due to the Flamingo's multitude of delays, grand openings, and grand reopenings. Siegel would die at the frustrated hands of mob investors on June 20th, 1947. His murder is unsolved to this day. It's impossible to say whether or not Scalise was involved with the orchestration of Siegel's murder, but what we do know is that after Siegel was gone, Scalise's star rose in the casino business. Scalise and Anastasia worked well together and ran in the same circles in particular those involving Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello. What is critical to understand is that while Anastasia was technically Mangano's underboss, he was very much a boss in his own right, and Scalise was among his closest men. Anastasia owned the docks, so it was a very advantageous match for Mangano. However, Mangano's pride soon got in the way, and he became so frustrated with Anastasia, mostly because Anastasia opted to work with Luciano and Costello without Mangano's permission, that the two came to blows. This would end poorly for Mangano, who would wind up going missing. His brother's body was found on April 19, 1951, and Mangano himself would be declared dead a decade later. After Mangano's disappearance, Anastasia became the boss of the family, and Frank Scalise, who had been patiently waiting in the wings, became underboss, and Scalise would maintain this position under Anastasia for the rest of his life. In 1954, Scalise was suspected for the murder and then disappearance of brothers Vincent and Benedetto Macri, respectively. Scalise would die before law enforcement could ever nab him for this crime. Scalise would receive a vagrancy charge in the Bronx, but the charge was dismissed. Also in 1954, Scalise and Anastasia were known to be selling membership into the Mafia. The books were open, meaning that the opportunity to be made was now available. For the first time since the 1930s, and several would-be mobsters were happy to pay the forty to $50,000 price tag the men were charging for the privilege. It's said that Scalise would collect around 200 of these payouts. In addition to crimes such as murder, police suspected that Scalise was a major player in the drug trade. He was even subpoenaed in 1955 to testify before a Senate committee investigating drug trafficking. Despite what we can postulate about his criminal activities, Scalise only ever referred to himself as a contractor, and had many nominally legal businesses to back that up particularly in the construction business. Scalise was a stockholder and the vice president of Mario and Devono Plastering Company. This company was big in housing projects, but got their big break with the airport. Mario and Devono Plastering was contracted for the construction of the permanent international arrival and departure building at the JFK International Airport, formerly Idlewild International Airport. There was some question during Scalise's life about whether or not he was related to labor racketeer George Scalise, but it turns out that he's not related to him. With his money, Scalise would indulge in a blue Cadillac coupe that he would drive around the city. Scalise's brother Jack owned a candy store, 
which was surely some sort of front. And at this candy store, Scalise enjoyed stopping in to have lunch with Jack. In fact, it was after leaving that candy store that Scalise would meet his demise. On June 17th, 1957, Scalise had just finished lunch with Jack about an hour and a half prior to when he was gunned down at a fruit stand in the Bronx. He was attacked by two gunmen and shot four times, once in the larynx, once in the left cheek, once in the right shoulder, and once on the right side of his neck. Scalise's murder actually served for the inspiration for the famous scene in The Godfather when Don Corleone was gunned down in front of Fredo at a fruit stand. It's actually surprising how many mobsters are gunned down at fruit stands, and most of these do claim to be the inspiration for The Godfather, but Scalise's murder seems to be the real deal. The circumstances behind Scalise's murder are unclear. Some believe that Carlo Gambino had him taken out so that he could ascend to the underboss position, and then within the same year, take out Anastasia, and take over his boss. Others suggest that Anastasia himself put out a hit on Scalise because he believed he was becoming too power-hungry and wanted to get him out of the way. If true, it's a shame that Anastasia did not demonstrate that level of discernment with Gambino. The official answer on Scalise's murder, as with many of these early gangster slayings, is that it's unsolved. Scalise's funeral took place at Sacosa Funeral Home and was attended by several law enforcement agents. Francesco Scalise was buried at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, New York. He was 63 years old at the time of his death. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews discussing the Gambino boss, Frank Scalise. Despite Scalise's major influence and impact in the Gambino family, he managed to stay off the grid for the most part. Make sure to let me know in the comments section below or on Facebook and Twitter what you think about Frank Scalise. Also, don't forget to utilize that comment section in social media to let me know about who or what you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you, and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao.